Welcome to Matters Financial and Geopolitical from a Frontier. I hope you had a great weekend. Um, we've got all our dogs back now, but then they try to take off again. So I don't know what's going on. It seems to me that they wanted to show the other two where they'd gone. Um, but anyway, the big news is we're hosting the Central Bank Governor, Patrick Girogi, at Main Speak, Saturday, the 28th of May. Looking forward to that tremendously. That follows on our uh, Main Speak session with Kenya Bankers, Habil Alaka, Joshua Oigara of KCB, and of course John Gachora of NIC Bank. So this should be a very interesting Main Speak going by the response I've had on Twitter since I announced it. Tim Peake. This is as far north as my lens will stretch, Greenland's southern coast. And then I was reading a new book by Paul Auster called Invisible. But I still think his best book was The Music of Chance. If you haven't read it, do read it. It's just another word for the same thing. You want to believe in some hidden purpose. You're trying to persuade yourself there's a reason for what happens in the world. I don't care what you call it, God or luck or harmony. It all comes down to the same bullshit. It's a way of avoiding the facts, of refusing to look at how things really work. I like this photograph of the Jal Mahal, the water palace. It's a palace located in the middle of the Mansaga Lake in Jaipur. And I finally got my copy of Roberto Villano's 2666, and I couldn't put it down all day yesterday. Um, pretty engrossing stuff, as, as I've expected from reading tidbits on the internet about him and about the book. People see what they want to see, and what people want to see never has anything to do with the truth. Everything is a burned book, my dear maestro, music, the 10th dimension, the 4th dimension, cradles, the production of bullets and rifles, westerns, all burned books. Political reflections, Venezuelan government has seized control of factories as country risks economic explosion. President Nicolas Maduro has threatened to seize factories that have seized production and arrest their owners after extending emergency powers amid the country's massive economic crisis. Maduro made his remarks Saturday, ordering all actions to recover the production apparatus which is being paralyzed by the bourgeoisie. He added that factory owners sabotage the country by halting production at their plants. The Associated Press reports that Empresas Polar, the country's largest food and drink distributor, closed its last beer plant claiming that the company lacked the capital to purchase the raw materials necessary to continue production. Mr. Madero sees the action of Empresas Polar as a deliberate attempt to destabilize the economy. The president accused Washington of plotting a coup against his administration, similar to the temporary ousting of the then president Hugo Chavez in 2002. You can hear the ice cracking, you know there's a crisis coming, our pressure on this isn't going to resolve this issue, one official told reporters. This is really not the case that the US is rooting for any outcome other than there not to be an economic meltdown or social violence. There are reasons for concern that over the summer, as Venezuela gives importance to payments on debt over imports, that these events could spiral. Venezuela opposition slams desperate Maduro state of emergency, 60-day state of emergency due to what he calls plots from Venezuela and the United States to subvert him. Um, and then I, I like this tweet from Nicolas Maduro, I can't say it in, French, in Spanish, Nuestras nación tiene fuerza para defenderse, para que esta patria no la toque nadie. I have to get a rich wrap up and use the translate button on Twitter. August 2015, I said the end is nigh for crude oil and oil producers from Caracas to Luanda, from Rio to Abuja. Um, um, I said these economies are going to contract, currencies which have already collapsed are going to be routed, and Greek style austerity will be the order of the 
day the meltdown is coming and here we are. 12th of January last year I spoke about the oil warfare specialist, President Obama, having successfully wrestled crude to below $50 a barrel. And with that it affected a chokehold on Putin's Russia, Venezuela and others as far afield as Nigeria and Angola. Mr. Capriles said at a rally, Venezuela is a bomb that could explode at any moment. It's a very fluid situation there. We knew it was coming. It seems to be a lot closer now. South Africa's presidency denies report of Gordon Arrest Hausta. The office of South African President Jacob Zuma denied that the finance minister would be arrested or replaced, refuting a Sunday Times report that said a special police unit has sent two prosecutors the docket of its probe into Pravin Gordan. The so-called Hawks Police Unit completed its investigation of Gordan and eight other former officials over their alleged involvement in a special agency within the National Revenue Service, the Sunday Times reported. A prosecution may prompt Zuma to replace Gordan, who ran the service until 2009, with Brian Molefe, whom I met at January McCamber's um, Mike speaking. Uh, Brian is currently the CEO of the state-owned utility ESCOM Holdings. I have a high regard for Brian, actually. But ousting Gordan will be the straw that broke the Rand's back, in my opinion. NASA oil temperature is out. Warmest April on record beats the previous record by largest margin ever. 23rd of November, I said, I cannot help feeling we are like frogs in boiling water. We have created massive interference in the cosmic fine-tuning phenomenon. From there I jumped to Olafur Eliasson's The Weather Project, which I like. And I also like this invisible house, location Hampton, Australia. Let's move on to the markets. The US curve flat flattened nine basis points last week, which is its most aggressive week of flattening since July last year, essentially market thinking that the likelihood of further rate hikes is diminishing. Currency markets, the euro is at 113.22, dollar index 94.58, Japanese yen 108.70, Swiss 0.9764, the pound 143.70, Aussie 0.7295, India rupee 66.855, South Korean won 11.7760, the real 353, Egyptian pound 887, South African rand, uh, when I looked earlier, was at 1550, and that's all about the uncertainty around Gordon. Dollar index, I'll put up a six month chart. As long as it can hold above 93 meaningfully, I think the long term bull run is still intact. Commodity markets, gold popping a little bit higher, 1282.35, strong rally this morning. Um, and I think it's consolidating ahead of a launch over 1300. Crude oil, $47.50. Last time I checked, that was the US July contract, looking very firm indeed. Um, and this, I think, is really a story of Nigeria. Silver has gained 24% in 2016, and hedge funds have now expanded their bullish bets on silver to an all time high. MSCI Emerging Market Index is below 801, and according to uh, Annie Rood Seti, remains bearish below that. At the heart of political upheavals is usually an economy in absolute disarray. This is Brazil's worst recession in a century. This is David Inglis tweeting us a diagram. Moody's have downgraded Saudi Arabia to A1 from AA3. Watched a very interesting video in French for now and 20 minutes, but extremely good. Uh, the Irresistible Ascension de Moishi Katumbi. And this is a documentary about Moishi, his football team, how he operates, gives you a very interesting insight into what's going on there. And the question is, can he replicate that? Um, I think he's obviously a populist and very popular, and I'm not convinced Kabila can keep a lid on the street. My article over the weekend was called The Geopolitics of Pipelines in East Africa. Given that Uganda's decision to export its crude oil to world markets via the port of Tanga is now a done deal, it is worth analyzing what has happened and appreciating that this is the equivalent of a blow to the solar plexus of our regional ambitions 
and that these ambitions are gasping for breath. Recall that Ethiopia has already dialed up the Djibouti route and that Lapset is in essence a Kenyan South Sudan gig and that South Sudan is back at ground zero and is not in a position to finance its own recovery, let alone a pipeline. If the renowned short seller Mr. Chanos could short Lapset, I'm sure he would be limited short. The widely read Africa Confidential said this, Uganda's decision to export oil through Tanzania undermines Kenya's status as regional kingpin. The move alters the political balance of the whole region and has left Kenya with some catching up to do. The preferred route until the second half of last year, Kenya now has a considerably less viable oil field and a damaged reputation as the heartbeat of East African integration. Chatham House, in an earlier report, said Uganda's Foreign Affairs Minister also highlighted the issue of relative costs of the, of the rival routes. The projected cost of the Tanzania route is approximately $4 billion, up to $1 billion less than going by Kenya. Kenya's proposed tariff was almost $17 per barrel, compared to Tanzania's $12 per barrel. Uganda's energy minister has also reported that Tanzania has waived land fees, transit charges and taxes associated with the pipeline. When you look at the numbers, our pipeline build was 25% more expensive and our price per barrel 29.411% more costly. We realised that we were never in the pipeline again. Frame the question as a national interest one for Uganda, it's a no-brainer. Then you have to ask, where was our intelligence? How could we be so far away from the winning bid? When I worked in the city and missed a big trade, I would always call back and ask how far I'd missed by. Differentials of 25% and 29.411% would be terminal to the relationship. Tanzania's President John Magafuli has shifted the centre of gravity for East African oil and gas south in one fell swoop. In my humble opinion, Magafuli has moved with speed and precision and paired the price of brokerage charges. He's winning. It's time for some serious soul-searching folks. Dr. Mo Ibrahim, we are poor because we are mismanaging our resources. President Lungu, if we find that there are conditionalities which we find acceptable, we will work with them, he told reporters on Friday in Lusaka. If not, we will throw them out. Both the IMF and the government have said any aid program would only be finalised after the polls. Zambia faces a key challenge funding growing budget deficit, which is slightly less than 8.1% of this year. There is this superstitious belief that when you embrace the IMF, you're bewitched and end up dying. The economy will die, he said. No, it doesn't work like that. A lot of other countries have gone to the IMF. We are members of the IMF, and we should go there when we have difficulties. Clearly, they have to. They haven't got any other choice. South Africa Zuma says to return land to blacks as vote looms. He was always going to lurch into that sort of area. Um, government pushed through a new law to compensate the black majority for stolen land, stepping up populist rhetoric for August local polls. South African all shares up 1.79%. Have a look at the dollar rand six month chart. We're back at 15.50. This is all the uncertainty over um, uh, Gordon feeding in. Nigeria's central bank has denied a report of a planned devaluation. The news website saharareporters.com said President Buhari had agreed to devalue the Naira in exchange for funds from the IMF to help offset a slump in oil revenues. Um, uh, quoting unnamed Buhari aides, it said the Naira rate to the dollar could fall to 290 compared with 198 currently. However, a spokesman for the central bank, Isaac Okora IV, said the rumour that the Naira is going to be devalued is false. Um, look, it is inevitable it's going to be devalued. That's the point. Petro Metrics, an oil research group, believes Nigerian production may, be as little, be, may now be little more than a million barrels per day. Nigerian oil share down 7.69% this year. Ghana Stock Exchange Composite Index down 10.32% this year. Africa has more large businesses than you expect, says McKinsey. 
has identified 700 African companies with annual sales of more than $500 million, many of which are growing and reinvesting in our reason for optimism about economic prospects on the continent. There's a lot more than most people would think, said Dominic Barton on Friday. Two-thirds of them are private. That's pr probably why we don't know about them, and they're growing. Of the companies identified with annual revenue larger than $500 million, 300 are in South Africa, 133 in North Africa, 56 are in Nigeria. There was a look of satisfaction in President Uhuru Kenyatta's eyes as he sat down to talk to the Africa Report of Paris. Um, could be attributed to more than three days of intense hospitality on a state visit to the French capital. We have been vindicated, said Uhuru Kenyatta in his opening line. This is about the ICC. Standard Investment Bank has given Safaricom share a higher valuation of 19 shillings and 50 cents. My target, of course, is 22.50. Kenya Shilling had a nine-month high, 100.62. Nairobi All Share up 0.69%, closed at a, at a month high, uh, uh, at, a, at a high for May. Um, Friday, NSC 20 down 2.8% so far this year. If you didn't watch that IMF press, press conference about the Eurobond, do take a look. Um, uh, and finally, uh, Safaricom, let's just go through what happened on close of Friday. Safaricom closed the week at 17.30, up 6.13% year-to-date, um, less than 1% 1, 1 below its 2016 high. I expect that to be taken out. TPS Serena was up, to, but it's really been in the doldrums. It was good to come across Mahmoud Jan Mohammed and the Tiger Club over the weekend. I didn't get a chance to quiz him on the business, however. Central Bank Governor said a lot of things uh, at WEF. If people did the wrong things, they should be held accountable. We are going to take them to a court of law, put them behind bars. It's essential for people to understand that banking is not shopkeeping. It's not like a fruit seller on a corner. You get deposits from the population in trust. You have a fiduciary responsibility to discharge. There was a reset in thinking of how the sector is organized and how it delivers value. Kenya has just gone through that reset. It's done because we are now in the new normal. Our aspiration is to become better than in Dubai without the tower, he said. We're thinking Singapore, we're thinking any other financial sector in the world. About Barclays' divestment of its Africa business, he said, it feels like we're being treated like flower girls who have no real role to play in the transaction. There are consequences of their actions in the 12 plus jurisdictions they operate in. They need to talk to the regulators. Barclays firm 0.485% to close at 10.35. It's down 23.89% year to date because of the uncertainty around ownership. KCB was the most traded share on Friday, just 1.75% below its 2016 high. Kenjin, which of course announced that two for one rights issue, uh, closed at 7.15, lost about 10% last week, but I really think it's all in the price, notwithstanding the fact that it's a two for one ratio terms of the rights issue. EABL, which has been a standout and I look forward to catching up with Charles tomorrow night, firm 0.33% to close at 297. That's up 8.79% year today, excluding a special dividend and an interim dividend. Once again, thank you kindly for stopping by.